Greetings. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. Happy World Ocean Week. Happy belated World Ocean Day. It has been such a great week uh, so far. I am here live at the Explorers Club uh, in New York, in Manhattan, and we've had just such an incredible series of events in partnership with the Explorers Club talking to ocean scientists, explorers, researchers, filmmakers, conservationists, artists. It has been just a blast, and we still have two days to go. We've got our Green Ocean Day today, so we are celebrating uh, the plants that are so important for the health of our ocean, for the health of our planet. We had seagrass this morning, mangroves. Now we're going to jump into the kelp world. I want to share a link here, exploring by the seat.com backslash ocean week. If you want to check out the live classroom events, you can look at recordings of past events, register for the events coming up. Tomorrow's our shark day. We have two really cool events coming up tomorrow morning. And then this afternoon at 1 p.m. Eastern, you won't want to miss National Geographic photographer Brian Scary taking us into the world of whales. That should be a blast. I'm looking forward to that one, of course. Uh, Explorers Club might be new to some people out there, so visit explorers.org. You can find the events this week. There's a whole series of live events. So if you're close to the club, maybe around the New York area, and you want to come into live events today or tomorrow, you have an option to check them out there. As well, There, many of them are being broadcast live um, to YouTube so you can, or Facebook, so you can check them out there. So we are going into the kelp world, and we've got a great person to help us do that. We have Josie Islin with us. She is joining us from the West Coast. She's the author of numerous books. She combines art and science uh, of our oceans. Her newest book, The Curious World of Seaweed, was released uh, in August 2019. So uh, she studied visual and environmental studies uh, from Harvard. She ended up at San Francisco State University after that. And so her writing and art have really focused on seaweed, on kelp, the sea otter, and it's really put her on the forefront of ocean activism. And she's collaborated with scientists and groups working to help protect kelp forests of our Pacific Ocean. So Josie, let's bring her in live with us right now. Hey, Josie. Hi, everybody. How are you doing today? It's great to have you with us. I'm great. It's early morning out here on the West Coast, and I'm coming to you all from the seaweed drying shed of a friend of mine who is a seaweed harvester up here in Mendocino County, California, where the ocean is really cold and really rough and really beautiful. All right. And I see some gear back there. It looks like a wetsuit. Yeah, it's a wetsuit and it's a really thick neoprene wetsuit, which is what you need for being in the water up here. Um, Absolutely. Very important. But once you get into those kelp forests, what a world to explore. Biodiversity, uh, just amazing. Yeah, no, I'm so happy to be here. And it's so important to be here with whales and sharks. Those are the things that people get, you know, traditionally really excited about. But my job is to get people and you guys especially excited about the kelps and seaweeds, which are just as important um, and haven't don't get as much recognition as as things like sharks. Absolutely. Well, Josie, if you want to share your screen, I know you have a presentation ready for us. Sure. I love that you're bringing art into the sciences because not everybody is going to be a scientist. Not everybody has that passion, but through art and so many other uh, careers, you can still contribute and still make a a big difference. Absolutely. Um, Did that share? Yeah, I see it popped up there. If we just bring the presentation to the front, we should be good to go. Oh, there we go. How about that? How does that look? That looks perfect. We're good. Awesome. There we go. Is that it? Yep, we got it. Great. So, um, yeah, I am trained as an artist. And um, sorry, we'll get that to go away. Um, I'm trained as an artist, not as a scientist. So I'm here to really champion all of you who are interested in making artwork or writing or other artistic um, endeavors. You can also learn the science of the oceans. And I chose the seaweeds as something to go really deep into to learn about. Um, And so another word for seaweed is algae or marine algae. So I kind of say art and algae um, is kind of like art and science coming together. So here are some pictures uh, of these big curtains that I've made that go into all sorts of different galleries and, and different kinds of spaces. And this will give you an idea of what some of these 
al seaweed or marine algae look like. Um, and so on the left is this rosy red seaweed that looks like a feather that's called erythrophyllum. And then you have a seaweed that's called feather boa kelp because it actually looks like a feather boa. And then you have palmaria, which is this red one. And then on the far right is the macrocystis or giant kelp, which is one of the big massive kelps uh, that grow down in Southern California. So here it is, and this is a curtain that I've made that actually is hanging in a video store that has been unused. As you know, video stores just don't get any uh, use anymore. So it's been sitting empty. So I filled it with this kelp uh, imagery. So people out in a shopping center could encounter this great giant kelp, which can grow a foot a day and can be, oh, 80 to 90 feet tall. So how did I start getting excited about seaweed? Well, I was out on the coast here and I actually held up a piece of seaweed to the sky. So I challenge you, if you're ever out on the beach, um, just look for the seaweed. And if it's something that looks kind of dark and a little bit mucky, say, you know, I'm gonna challenge myself to hold it up to the sky and you might experience something like this, which is super red and really beautiful. And this is my studio in San Francisco. And I took that, that piece of seaweed uh, back to my studio and stuck it on my scanner and used the top portion there to push light through um, through the seaweed. So this is one way that I explore the seaweeds and kelp. And another way I explore the seaweed and kelp is as a snorkeler. I'm not a diver. I don't use scuba as some of the explorers might that you've uh, encountered, but I do snorkel whenever I can. And like I mentioned at first, you have to snorkel up here in Northern California. You have to wear a really thick uh, wetsuit because the water's really cold. Um, and this was last year. I went snorkeling just near where I am now out into this kelp bed that is out here on the right. Um, and there I am adventuring out into the ocean. And when I came back in, uh, this was some of the kelp that had washed up on shore. And I brought some of that kelp back to my studio in San Francisco. In fact, three little babies of kelp. And I made them into this, using that scanner that I showed you, made them into this image here, uh, which is hanging in a gallery in downtown San Francisco, um, where we're doing all sorts of uh, not only visits by people who want to come see the art, but also conversations about the kelp forest. And I'll go into more about what's happening with our kelp forest here. Um, but this is what I can do as an artist is really bring a little bit of the ocean right onto the into the city streets and um, and kind of tell us about them. So on the left is the bull kelp. So out here in California on the beaches, you find this big, heavy, long stipe with a big bulb at the end and then these blades that flow out and that is our bull kelp or neriocystis. And that's what I spend most of my time thinking about. Um, and this is another gallery installation where I got to collaborate with a whole bunch of scientists um, to kind of bring their world out um, to people like you. And so I love, love, love working with scientists and they like my work as well. So this is what I can create with my scanner. I can create these really vibrant, vibrant pictures and whoever thought seaweed could be this color red. Um, and this is really the color of this seaweed. And this is what I get to write about. And these are these really cool seaweeds out here called sea sacks. And they actually are like these fingers that grow up from the rock and have all this water in them. They have the ocean right inside of them. Because you have to remember that seaweed, when the tide goes out, it has to stay um, wet or it has to stay alive in that drying period because the normal world for our seaweeds is very different than the normal world for us. Its world is wet. So um, you can actually squeeze these uh, sea sacks and they make little spraying things. And here's a feathery seaweed. Um, I'm going to just bomb through this and get to the kelp. This is the feather boa kelp, um, which is so wonderful and wacky. Um, it's really a favorite of mine. You can see what I can do with my scanner to bring these from the ocean out into the world. Um, and I can experiment with how to make images. And then this experimentation can get me to ask questions. And then I can write about what those questions are telling me. And I also make sun prints or cyanotypes. Uh, and I hope you all get a chance to make sun prints. I would love to come to your classroom to make sun prints with you using my 
um, my seaweed specimens. Um, this little sausage-like one here on the left is called a cytosiphon. Um, and I get to put my scans inside of its cyanotype. So I can really combine the red. That's This is really the color of this seaweed is this red. And then I've put it on its in its in its shadow of its blue cyanotype. So it's kind of playing. I get as an artist to have the seaweed itself, the scan of the seaweed, play with its own shadow. And then that gets us thinking about, wow, I never thought about seaweed like that before. I never thought seaweed could be this beautiful. And then that lets us go learn about its color. Wow, well, seaweed comes in three colors of red, green, of red, the greens, and the browns. Um, and here's a book that I made um, called An Ocean Garden, The Secret Life of Seaweed, which explains some of this stuff. Um, and this is my next book. This is a brown seaweed called uh, um, Bladder Chain Rack. Um, but I want to get to the bull kelp story because that's the story that I am most interested in. So here's a picture of where I am right now. So I'm going to go to this place in about two hours um, when the tide is low. And in California, we have these big winds that come in in the springtime and they push the surface waters of the ocean away. And that allows that deep, rich water um, to well up, to come up from the deep. And that upwelling that it's called is full of nutrients and good food for not only the whales and the sharks, which it's super important for, but also for the seaweeds. So under this water here, there's all sorts of seaweed growing, even though it's so rough. Uh, there's all sorts of seaweeds and, and kelp growing. And this is what it kind of looks like when you go out on the beach. And most people kind of go, ew, that's a little bit slimy and it might smell a little bit. And you have lots of kelp flies all over it. But when you look at this, you will see, wow, look at all the different textures there are and the different colors. Wow, there's so many different, I and mean, you can see some of the seagrasses. You probably talked about seagrasses this morning. Well, those are really important in, out there and they're part of all of this stuff. So here's how we can start thinking about the seaweeds and the kelps is that they break down into three color groups. The reds have a red and a blue pigment that combine that to capture the sun because these are all photosynthesizing plants. I mean, we don't really call them plants, we call them algae, but they're like our plants on land where they're gathering sun and they're using that to fuel growth. They photosynthesize. So the green algae there that you see in the middle, that has chlorophyll in it. And chlorophyll is what all the plants on land use to capture sunlight to drive photosynthesis. Well, guess where all the plants on land came from? They came from this green algae, this green seaweed. It evolved to migrate from the ocean up onto land. And then that is what evolved into all of the plants on land. That's why they have the green chlorophyll. But in the ocean, they have these different colored pigments to collect different kinds of light. And the brown seaweed there is the, includes the kelps and it has a brown pigment in it to collect uh, light that combines with, um, with the chlorophyll to make these beautiful golden colors and olive colors. And so the kelp I wanna talk about today because it's really important for us out on our um, coast here in California is bull kelp. And bull, these are two teenage bull kelps here that I found and brought into my studio. And the kelp have just a basic, some basic parts, which is a hold fast at the bottom there, at the end on the left, which is holding this kelp to a rocky surface on the bottom. And then it has this long stipe um, that, is, that is growing up and pushing, and the bulb is full of gas and pulling that stipe up towards the surface. And um, so here's, uh, here I am going out into uh, a little bit of a kelp uh, forest. And this is what um, I saw just last week under the water. And here is that bull kelp uh, that I was just talking about. So you can see the parts here. You have the stipe, the bladder, and then you have the blades. And the blades are what are really putting themselves out there to capture light. Uh, and then with the nutrients of the ocean, that's what makes this kelp can grow a foot a day. So here I am in Alaska, actually, 
going into this really cold water. And here's two of these bull kelp that is right out there offshore. So you can see this stipe is very long and straight. It's being pulled by the current. That bladder has just gotten to the surface and those blades are streaming out along the surface to capture the sunlight as efficiently as it can. Um, and it's always, it feels like flagpoles out there. And you can see all the understory kelps. Now, the reason this is so healthy is because the ocean is cold and full of nutrients. And here are some more little kind of teenage kelps that haven't quite gotten to the surface yet. Um, their bulbs are stretching them up. The surface is right up there. You can feel the sunlight up top, um, but it's reaching up. These grow all in one year, the bull kelp does. So they started a couple months ago and in just a few months, they um, will become these big mature by the middle of the summer, they'll be, they'll be adults. And then by the end of the summer, they'll be grandmas. So these bull kelp all do all of their growing in one year um, and then they have to reproduce. But I just want to show you what the difference is in, in looking from above. So this is me popping my head up out of the ocean. And here's um, my friends, Patrick and his daughter, Nora, in their kayaks. And you can see the, the surface of the ocean. And this is kind of full of red light of sunlight. But then when you pop down under the ocean, you go back into this world um, and this world of, of the marine algae. And it's so exciting to me. Um, so I want to go a little bit more into the story, the life cycle of this bull kelp, because it has to do all this growing in one year. And it starts out as these tiny babies, and the bulb is maybe as big as my thumb. Um, and then it grows into this big, mature bull kelp. And I hope you all get to California and can get onto the beach, because our beaches should be full of this rack of tumbled bull kelp. And you can drag it, and you can cut it, and you can make it into a... A, a trumpet. Um, you can do all sorts of things uh, with this mighty bull kelp. Um, and this is how it looks in a deeper forest, in the deeper kelp forest. You can see how it gets all tangled with itself. Um, so it can grow in water as deep as 60 to 90 feet. So it will grow really quickly. And the bulb by, by June, by right now, June or July, the bulb gets to the surface. And then the point of growth turns to the blades. And then the blades have these reproductive patches that then fall away uh, and, um, and uh, reproduce, set, set their spores. So I want to show you a series of pictures of the bull kelp here in the, on the Mendocino coast, right where I am. And this was in 2008. So before, probably um, that's uh, 12, 17, yeah, way before you were born. Um, but it was a gangbuster year for kelp. I mean, this is how much bull kelp was. This is what it looks like on the surface. Like birds could just walk across this kelp. And then in 2017, about three years ago, no, about uh, four years ago now, um, this, I was out um, kayaking and snorkeling in this bull kelp and it was much thinner. It wasn't that big, super dense patch. But I went to this same spot yesterday, in fact, and last year, and I took this picture, and there's no kelp at all. So the kelp forests in California are disappearing. And this is a huge concern because inside the kelp forest is where you have all sorts of other animals that live. The fish, the starfish, the sea urchins, the, um, we have abalone here, which are these big sea snails. And so what is happening out there under the ocean? Why do we have, why is our kelp forest going away? And so what you have here is a picture of, this was from me snorkeling a few years ago where you have this beautiful bull kelp. I'm underwater now um, on the left here. And then on the right, you have these purple sea urchins that have taken this kelp and they've pinned it to a rock face and they are gobbling it down. Sea urchins love kelp. So sea urchins are um, what we call herbivores. They eat the herbs or the plant life under the ocean. So uh, lots of snails and limpets and sea urchins, they all eat, plant, they eat the seaweed. That's what they eat. And this population of purple sea urchins has exploded 
in our California waters. And it's turned what was the kelp forest into this kind of carpet of purple urchin. And this is called an urchin barren. And there is no kelp. This, these urchins just gobble up all those baby kelp that I showed you that were very tiny. Well, they're very easy and very delicious to eat. So this urchin population has exploded. Uh, and you see right in the middle of there, that's an abalone. So that's a kind of a cool sea snail that also eats kelp. And the abalone population um, has not had enough to kelp to eat, so it's not doing very well. So there are two predators of the sea urchins. What was keeping this all in balance um, that made us go from this nice kelp on the left here to this urchin barren? And what let this, this population of urchins explode? Well, we had a whole number of events that happened here, and there are two predators of the urchins that disappeared. And the one main predator of the urchin is the sea otter. So sea otters love the kelp forest. They love, you can see this sea otter here is eating an urchin. They love to eat urchin. They can eat lots of urchin they need. They have no blubber like a seal. So sea otter depend on their fur uh, for keeping warm. And they um, have to eat a lot of food to keep that body temperature up. Um, but unfortunately, the sea otter up here in Northern California were hunted because of that fur. They were hunted to extinction 150 years ago, long ago, the sea otter were wiped out up here. So there was another predator that was keeping the sea urchins in control and eating the sea urchins and keeping their population in control. And that's this, this sunflower sea star, this huge predator starfish called the sunflower sea star um, or Pycnopodia. And this guy can actually, if you um, Google sunflower sea star eating an urchin, you can find some videos of it crawling pretty quickly over the seafloor. This is an enormous starfish. But we had a horrible starfish wasting disease and all of these starfish disappeared from the waters. Um, so we had, so we've had way, way, the result is way too many urchin. So right now here we have people who are coming into these areas, these coves, and taking, trying to um, uh, pull the urchin out themselves, trying to act as the top predator so that the kelp can grow. And we do have some kelp growth coming back. Uh, that's why I'm up here right now, is that I'm here to see what's happening out there uh, this spring under the ocean after we've pulled some of the urchin out. But this was a piece of artwork that I made a couple of years ago when I was really feeling sad about this kelp that I love disappearing. So I kind of made this ghost image, feels a little bit like a ghost kelp. Um, and I and I kind of put that ghost kelp uh, in on top of this um, picture that was made in 1840 by a wonderful um, naturalist. Uh, uh, he was a scientist, but he really was a scientist that, that turned into being an incredible artist. And his name was Alexander Postels. And he did this beautiful uh, drawing of the bull kelp. So I combined my my ghost of the kelp with his beautiful um, picture. So I want to just finish up with some more pictures of the kelp under the water. Um, this was again from just last week when I was in Alaska, uh, which is very similar. The water temperature is very similar to here in California uh, with the bull kelp uh, streaming out in the spring waters just below the surface. So I just wanted to finish with some pictures of just a variety of seaweeds, but there's bull kelp in each one. And if you guys can identify where the bull kelp is, this could be, I don't know, Joe, if you could make this a little quiz, but this is five kelp. And um, uh, if you guys could point to which one is the bull kelp, that would make me happy. Um, but um, we have sugar kelp, we have kombu, which is, I'm going from left to right, sugar kelp, kombu, an agresia or feather bow kelp, and then we get the bull kelp, and then we get another kelp called um, Costaria costata. Um, so can you guys find the bull kelp in this image? So I've layered all sorts of my different seaweeds together, and I have on the way left um, that those series of, of funny um, shapes that are on, stacked on top of each other, that's the giant kelp. Um, or macrocystis that's much more common in Southern California and in warmer waters. 
but you can probably uh, recognize those two little teenage bull kelp that I showed you earlier that's kind of down there on the, on the lower right-hand side. Um, so this is kind of my rendition of the richness and abundance and variety of seaweeds that we find right out here on our coast. I'm gonna go at low tide today, I'm gonna go out to the rocky shore and I'm gonna be seeing lots of these different seaweeds and being, oh, ooh, wow, look at that. Aren't they fabulous? Um, and here's another one. There's two bull kelp in this picture here um, amongst all the feathery Gloeocephonia and this very purple Maziella, which is purple because it has that red and blue. What happens when you put red and blue together? You get purple, and that's how these purple seaweeds get their colors. They have red and blue pigments inside of them that combine. But there's two bull kelp, well, there's three bull kelp actually. Down on the lower right, you have this jazzy um, two young bull kelp there, and then you have the bigger green kelp that is looping around up on the upper right. So I thought, oh, and here's two more, two more little baby bull kelp here that are in amongst, they're playing amongst the other seaweeds here that I put on my scanner all fresh from the ocean. So these, you can see some of the outlines of the water there, of the, of the ocean water. These I put on my scanner right from the beach or where I've collected them. Uh, so they, they kind of are holding some of the ocean with them. And then there's these two baby bull kelp that go right up the middle there. Um, so that's how they might have looked. Oh, if we're in June now, um, that's probably how they looked last month. And now um, you got to see how they look um, uh, when they're just a little bit older out there. So, um, this, this is my, these are my books. Um, I, you know, I'm just so happy to connect with any of you. Uh, that's my email. Please drop me an email with questions. That's my, I'm on Instagram at, at Josie Islin. Um, so I post lots of pictures of kelp <laughs> all the time. Um, I just posted one with herring row on it. Um, so um, I hope that there's time for questions. Um, Joe, I'll hand it back to you. Right. I guess. Thank you, Josie. That was a great presentation and a really an a exciting way to share the kelp uh, species in a very different way, in a way that's very accessible and in a way that's really beautiful for people who don't venture into that cold California water. Cool. Right. So we are going to get into Q&A very shortly. So I already see some questions in the chat. We'll meet our camera classrooms too. But first I want to get into our Kahoot quiz. So I am going to share a little banner here, kahoot.it. If you head over to that, um, it's gonna ask you for a pin number. I'm going to put the pin number on the screen right now. So let's get that going here. If you're lucky enough to have one-to-one -one tech, uh, then you can do this right at your seat and compete along with us. If not, no big deal. Your teacher could maybe pop this up on the projector screen at the front of the room, and you can shout out uh, your answers to him or her. So here's our PIN number. It is 319-0368. So let's see if we get a couple classrooms in here, maybe a few individual students, and then we'll go head to head. Um, how many questions? I did five questions this time, I believe. A, a few true and false, a few multiple choice. Um, things to think about. You want the right answer, that's important. You want to get it in as quickly as you can, that's worth even more points. Uh, and then you also, if you get it wrong, even if it's really fast, yeah, no points. So correct answer, uh, and then getting those answers in nice and quick. If it's easier and you have your device, well, you can do a little scan of that QR code and that should bring you right in uh, and you're able to compete. So I can see a couple classroom groups have joined us. Some of these will be classrooms. Some might be individual students and you get kind of fun little names, right? We've got animal names that are picked automatically for you like the genius lizard and the Arctic gator and the lively lobster. I wonder if we'll get a kelp. I don't think they go into plants. I think they stick to animals. Oh, see, we got to get a kelp name in there. Yeah, yeah. Polite bobcat, swift penguin. Yep, definitely looks like they focus on the on the wildlife. But as we learned today, the, the we've learned all day today, and uh, you know that plant life is so important, whether on land or in the water, uh, to our because ecosystem. Because we have to remember, it's the bottom of the food chain. Mm -hmm. It's what everyone starts with. All those snails that eat the algae get eaten by crabs, get eaten by sea otter. Yeah. Um, the um, all the um, smaller critters that eat the 
the plants are super important for all of the larger organisms. Absolutely. All right, here we go. We've got 20 groups in. Let us start uh, our kelp quiz. So let's see who comes on top. Who Who is the sharpest group, the sharpest student? Uh, which species of kelp does Josie work with a lot? Was it the feather boa kelp, the bull kelp, the kumbu, uh, or the giant kelp? Which species have we really talked about today? We've seen some amazing photos, different stages of their life cycles. Um, what was that species? All right, good Yay! job, crew. Went with the bull kelp and a very cool species. Let's see if a few more bull kelp questions come up. I think they just might. True and false here. Bull kelp can grow up to a foot a day. Is that true or is that false? I have definitely not come across many plants on land that can do that. That's for sure. You can imagine if that were your geranium plant in your backyard or your huh. kitchen window. Cookie. All right. It is true. That's just amazing. As they stretch their way, reaching up for the surface. Our scoreboard says the lively lobster is in first place at the moment. Let's see what happens after our next question. Algae. Algae can be found in which color or colors? Brown, green, red, or all of the above? So you can click one option, two options. You can go for the all of the above option, whatever you think. So exciting. Mm-hmm. All right. Good job, crew. Most went with all of Yay! the above. We learned about some of those pigments. The daring panda has dared to take first place. Let's go to our next true and false. Bull kelp cannot grow deeper than 50 feet. Is that true or false? Maybe if it's true, it's because there's not enough sunlight. Maybe it's false and there's more than enough sunlight. I guess we're gonna find out. Five more seconds on the clock. All right, we know that that's false. Josie, I believe you said between 60 to 90 feet. Yes, All it right. can grow deeper than 50 feet. Good stuff. Yeah, there's there's light that gets down there. It's 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 dimmer light, but it can get, that's why they have these different pigments is to capture that different light that gets down through the water. All right, Daring Panda, you are still in first. This is a multi-select question, so click the main predators of sea urchins. How many of these are you gonna click? Is it sea otters? Is it sunflower sea stars, great white sharks, or sea turtles? It's a multi-click question. Great questions here. Uh-huh. All right, we had good stuff. Yeah, most students nailed it. Click yeah, stars, awesome. click sunflower sea stars. Very cool. All right, let's come back. Let's look at our podium. Third place. Who's got that spot? The fast dog. In second place, we've got the smart quail. And taking that top spot, the kelp champ for today was the daring panda. I was able to hold on for a few questions at the end. All right, well, let's come back from that screen share because we definitely have time for some Q&A action. So let's get into that. And then we'll let Josie go and dive, uh, jump into the kelp and, uh, and see what's out there. So um, we're going to go to uh, some camera classrooms. We'll go to some YouTube questions. I see lots there. Ms. Cottrell's fifth graders are hanging out with us. Let's bring them in and see if they have a, a question for them. Hi, you guys. Joining us from New York. Ooh, cool. My question is, if all the kelp in the world disappeared, what would that do to the ecosystem? Oh, really good question. Thank you. So the kelp, every part of different, so kelp um, hug the continents. When you're looking at the globe, your map of the world, South America has its kind of kelp that hugs the coast of South America. And we up here in North America have our kind of kelp. And all of these kelps, need cold oceans. So as our oceans warm, it, we we don't quite know what's the, the kelp is going to have a harder and harder time getting as big and robust. 
And what that does is not only, I mentioned that the kelp is the bottom of the food chain. It's so it's the primary producer. It's like the food. It's like the grasses that the, the deer that I just saw outside are eating here on land. You won't, you, you won't have as much of that kind of food source for some of the snails and the limpets and the urchins and all of those other organisms that you love to go look at when you go in, out to the tide pools. But the other thing that kelp does that's really important and is it makes the kelp forest. And the forest underwater is like the forest on land where it's where all these other creatures live and where they can, like it's fish love the kelp forest because when a seal is coming for them, they can duck into the kelp forest and they can hide. Well, this so that's good for the fish. And the seal knows that when it needs to go find its lunch, it can go into the kelp forest and find um, its, its, its prey, so to speak. So it's, it's a place where predator and prey both can, can kind of um, uh, live. And um, the other thing is, is that the, the kelp forest also is a, what we might call a nursery. So a lot of the organisms in the ocean, and you might have learned this, are, have this pretty cool baby stage, which means they're larva. They kind of float as larva when they're young. So all of the starfish and the sea urchins um, have this, this young phase that is very vulnerable to getting eaten. So the kelp forest is like the nursery. It's where the babies can hang out and actually grow up to be their real larger organism self. Um, so without that, they're in much, much more danger of being eaten by all those other um, ocean going creatures. So it's, it's called a habitat engineer or an eco engineer. It engineers a place to live for so many other organisms. So we, you, you lose that and you get a, just a much simpler ocean system. And that's um, what we want. We just need to keep our oceans cold. All right, we do. We need those cold, nutrient-rich waters. They're so important. Um, you may not like jumping in them all the time, but we, we definitely need them. Uh, Ms. Hatoum's Guru is joining us in Ottawa. So joining us from Canada. Hi, How guys. are you doing today? There they are. Cool. So exciting. Mm-hmm. All right. Do you have a question for us? We're ready. You just have to grab the mute for me. You're on mute right now. There we go. Um. So how, why? So what kind of chemical was the chemical that took out all the sunflower starfish? Ooh, good question. So it was called it was a disease called um, starfish wasting disease, and in the past it's it's a virus of some sort. So it's a natural virus that is in the ocean waters, and it's again a mystery. A lot of scientists have been studying this, um, and and it's not new. There has been starfish wasting disease in the past, but usually it's just been in one place. Like there was starfish wasting disease, say just in Southern California, and it didn't affect the starfish up here in Northern California or up in Oregon or British Columbia in Canada or Alaska. But this time about three years ago or four years ago, this starfish wasting disease was much, much broader than it ever had been before. And they don't, they, they don't quite know. It was a virus, they think. And one of the, the reasons why it spread, we think, so much more widely is because at that, those same years, the, oh, we had these warm ocean events, this ocean blob, this warm blob came down from Alaska and kind of parked itself here off of California. So we had a series of events that made it much worse than usual. Um, so we think those warming oceans not only contributed to making that starfish wasting disease where the starfish would sadly just kind of dissolve. It was very sad and kind of gross. Um, uh, but it also gave rise to all of those urchins, uh, the population exploding. So the warm ocean events are, uh, all sorts of things can happen that we, we don't quite understand. 
Right. Great question. Uh, yeah. Let's grab one from YouTube now. So let's see. Miss Gail's class is with us, and they would like to know a few questions here. So let's grab one of them here. Um, oh, okay. Have you ever, in your adventures and your explorations, have you ever had a question about seaweed or kelp you couldn't find the answer to? What would you do in that situation? Oh, well, there's, I, I, I definitely come, seaweeds and kelp are very complex in terms of their life history. And even last night, I was just chatting with my friend Larry, who goes out into the, um, what's called into the low tide, and he uh, harvest seaweed very sustainably uh, so that you can buy it in the market and cook with it. And he had some questions about the life cycle of nori. Um, and I so hope you've all eaten sushi and nori is really a delicious seaweed, but it has a very complicated life cycle. And it also tends to grow on these rocks that are covered with, get covered with sand. And sand is something that comes in and out. And we had this question about how does the kelp that has no no seaweed or nori on it um, one month can be covered with sand and then the sand will go out and then this huge growth of the nori or um, it's called pyropia will be growing on that same rock and we were like how do we how do we learn about this question well one way is to go to the internet and try to understand get a um, and Google nori life cycle and we get some pictures. But the other important way is to find the expert and to find a mentor. And my mentor in seaweed, has, in learning these very, kind of answering these more complex questions is a woman named Kathy Ann Miller, who's a very deep seaweed scientist. Mm -hmm. um, and she is the curator of marine algae at UC Berkeley, which is across the bay from where I live. Um, and I've done lots of workshops with her up here on the, on the Mendocino coast and been able to ask her directly these very kind of pointed questions that I haven't been able to find answers for anywhere else. So there are lots of seaweed experts out there. Um, they're called phycologists, P-H-Y-C-O-L, phycologists, phycologists. And I've made really good friends with a lot of phycologists. So um, if I have a question about bull kelp that I can't find the answer to, I know there's a guy named Tom Mumford who lives up in Washington state and he's an absolute expert on bull kelp and can at, le at least point me to some of the answers. So finding your mentors. Very important. Absolutely. Sea otters. How often do you see them? How close do they come? Oh, oh, very cool. Well, so sea otters in California, you have to go down to Monterey. Um, to, to Monterey, California, and that area to see the sea otters. So if you come to California, really good to go to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. It's one of the most exciting places. They have a fantastic sea otter program. So they have some captive, like some, some actually they're usually um, stranded sea otters that they've raised in their tanks there. And then they use those sea otters as surrogate moms for other stranded pups. So at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, you can often see the mom and a pup and she's the, the sea otter um, care for their single pup for almost a year and they teach them everything. And it's really, really wonderful to see. But out in the wild, you really are supposed to stay if you're kayaking in that area. There's quite a lot of sea otter around. I think you're supposed to stay about 50 yards away uh, and not engage with the wild um um, sea otter. Now, I was just up in Alaska with our sea otter around in the wild, and we were um, we had our binoculars and we were kayaking, but they kept a good distance. They definitely kept um, oh a good fifty to a hundred yard, seventy five yards away. So we needed our binoculars and we could see that it was a mom and her pup. But they're curious. And they kind of they they tend to go upright when they want to look at you. Um, and um, so they don't let you get too close. And as a wild critter, you don't want to get too close, but they are super cute and pretty awesome. All right. Yeah. And I know it's a bummer sometimes. You want to see them, you want to be close, but it is really important to give them their space. <laughs> Bring your binoculars. Exactly. Very cool. Uh, let's go to our Ottawa crew and see if they have one more question for us. We'll see if we can squeeze in one question from 
two more classrooms and then we'll we'll sign off on our green ocean action. Oh, yeah. Okay, Hello, come. How old can sea kelp be? Oh, that is really cool question. So, so different sea kelp. So kelp can be either just like in your backyard. If you are planting your garden with your family, um, you might have perennials, which are bushes that grow each year and they come back and you don't have to replant them. And then you have annuals, which are sometimes some of the flowering pots that you kind of have to plant every year. And kelp is the same way. You have perennials that will grow from that hold fast. So when I talk about the giant kelp in Southern California uh, with those big leaves, uh, that giant kelp is a perennial. So it can grow to be four or five years old from one hold fast. And the hold fast gets bigger and bigger out under the water. But my bull kelp that you guys identified as being kind of what I'm studying the most is what's called an annual. So it will really only, it will start growing in the spring and it will grow up through the summer. But then when it hits fall time and winter, many, many of those plants that just started growing in the spring will be ripped up by the winter storms and thrown on shore. And that will be the end of its life. It's really an annual. It will only, some of the, some of those kelp will last until the next season. So maybe they'll get to be a year and a half old. And in bull kelp world, to be 18 months old is like you're a grandma or a grandpa. Um, so not there is one kelp called, um, it's winged kelp or walking kelp um, uh, called pteragophora. And it can grow up to 17 years old. And that's really, really old for a kelp. Um, and those are very special. And um, so you'll find those up here as well. So it's not like trees on land. Okay, and our New York crew, do you have a final question? There's someone. We're here. Is kelp healthy for, yes, is kelp healthy for people to eat? Mm, yes, it is. It's not maybe as tender as some of the other seaweeds, but one of the things about kelp and seaweed is that it takes up all these nutrients of the ocean. So that includes sodium or salt and potassium and iodine, which is really important for your brains to develop. So it soaks up all those nutrients and that's what fuels its growth as well as the sunlight. And so that means that all the seaweeds and, and kelps out there are healthy. Nothing is poison. It's not like mushrooms where you have to be careful. Um, and if anything is edible now, because they soak up all that ocean, you have to be really careful that if you're going to eat your seaweed or your kelp, you are eating seaweed or kelp from really clean water. Because if it's polluted water, you'll be eating that pollution. So um, it's there are companies that make pickle out of kelp up in Alaska, where their kelp population is doing very well. Um, the nori, of course, is yummy. The, um, there's something called kombu, which um, I mentioned, and that's really good to cook with. And it all gives you these really good um, minerals and nutrients um, that are directly from the ocean. So yes, it's good to, you can find seaweed products out there in your, um, often you can find dried seaweed in your grocery stores. Um, they're very healthy for you. All right, great question. Well, let's start off with a big shout out to our classrooms. Thank you so much yeah. to our classrooms. Thank you so much to our classrooms uh, tuning in via YouTube and the ones who will tune in later today as well with the links. Um, great questions. Thanks for playing Kahoot with us. I do want to mention, Josie, a shout out uh, to you being named one of the Explorers Club 50 this year, which is really, really cool. I'm really um, honored. Explorers Club, the last two years, has been looking around the world for a um, wide group of scientists and explorers and artists and conservationists and engineers and so on who are doing exciting work. Uh, so it's really great and exciting to be nominated and, and make this group. So huge congratulations uh, to you, Josie. Oh, well, I'm, I'm super honored to be part of the group. All right. We'll flash up the link one more time, exploringbytheseat.com backslash Ocean Week, Brian Scary, oh. Wales. Uh, at 1 p.m. Eastern today. And tomorrow we have some shark action in the morning at 
tenant at 11 o'clock Eastern. You don't want to miss it. Josie, thank you so much. Enjoy your time in the water today. It was great to have you with us. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks. Keep, right, keep looking a, out for kelp and seaweed. All right. Have a great rest of the week, everybody. Thanks so much.